Uh, Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. How are you guys doing? Grab your Bibles, turn to Psalm 100. It is Christmas time, a very special time of the year, and I'm glad that you're here. We've got a very special day planned. You can see it. We've got towels and T-shirts up here. It's a baptism Sunday. Later, we're going to invite you, if you've never given your life to Christ, to do that, but that's just just to get you ready for that. Um, First of all, I want to acknowledge that several of you are here today because of the invitations of your friends and family. We've been asking our family here at Eastview to invite as many people as they could for this Sunday. So if you answer that invitation, so glad you're here uh, and uh, welcome as our our guest today. Also, I want to invite you to another thing. I want to give you another invitation, Uh, Christmas Eve. We always celebrate Christmas Eve on December 24th. It's kind of a custom for us, like the rest of the world. If you guys are not awake yet, it's it's okay. Um, Anyway, uh, at 3 o'clock and 4.30 and 6 o'clock on that night, please come and celebrate Christmas Eve with us. We'd love to have you. And let me just give you a hint. If you come at 3 o'clock, you might be standing up. So think about coming at 4.30 or 6. There's usually a little bit more room if you can accommodate that. But that's another invitation. You know, the holiday season is about invitations. Come to something, right? Sometimes it's really simple. You just say to your friends and your family, hey, come to our house. We're going to have some snacks, and you tell them what to bring. We're going to pitch in. It's very intimate. We're doing this with our small group this Tuesday night. Hey, just come on over. We're going to hang out and just celebrate together, uh, share more things about this, the bears and the weather. We're going to talk about life and do life together, right? So there's an invitation. But sometimes invitations get weird, right, especially when it's a formal invitation. You start making a list of who you're going to invite. You guys ever done this? You start looking at people that you are going to invite to your party, and, and some of them are really easy. You, you want them there. They're going to be there. It's really awesome. But then you have acquaintances. You go, I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time with them, uh, but uh, I should. Right? You ever do that? You invite somebody that you should invite to your party, and so you send them, and you, and you just like cross your phone. Oh, please don't come. Please don't come. But, but you invite them, right? It's not a very sincere invitation. And then there are other people that, um, that you invite even though you know they can't come, but you send them an invitation. It's not sincere, any, any more sincere, but you send them an invitation because you hope that they know that you like them because you send them an invitation you know they can't come to. And then maybe they'll invite you to their party, right? Uh, on the other hand, it, when you're the receiver of invitations, it can get kind of weird because you get invitations from people and you're going, I really don't want to go, but I should. Right Now remember that should rule goes both ways. Maybe they sent you a card saying I should send it and you're going, I don't want to go but I will because I should. Neither one of you want to be with each other, but you should. And so you answer those invitations. This is the craziness that happens at Christmas sometimes. Sometimes you even get upset for not getting invited to a party that you don't want to go to and you can't go to. But they just should have invited you, right? And uh, we have this craziness during the Christmas season. It's a time of invitation. Sometimes the invitation can be as simple as save the date. You get a little card that says save the date. There's really no detail. Save the date to me is like, I don't know what we're doing, but I'm stealing a day from your calendar. Here, save the date, right? And so you get to save the date, or you can, you can be totally technologically cool, and you get on a place like punchbowl.com, and you can send someone an electronic virtual envelope that they virtually open that they virtually read and virtually are invited to your real party, all right? And so there's a lot of ways to invite people. But today, Psalm 100, that's where we're going to be studying from, is going to be a lot easier. Because when, when God makes up an invitation list, it's really simple. And it includes everyone. And Psalm 100 is going to be our invitation to celebrate Christmas together and think about the birth of the Christ child in the world. So let's look at Psalm 100. Here's what it says. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today, please. God, that's my simple prayer. That no one will walk out of here today without hearing a sincere and personal invitation from you to them. That the message of Christmas for all of us will become closer to come, 
And God, um, you have to do that because there are so many different things going on in every heart in this place right now. I can't fathom it, but you know it. And you know what needs to be said. And so I pray, Father, you would take the power of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit and the power of this preaching moment and that you would change our lives, you would invite us in. God, we worship you because you are a God of invitation and that blows us away. But God, now speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've said this before, and I'm sorry if you come here all the time and you have to hear it again, but oh, come, let us adore him. That's the theme of this sermon series. That's the song of this season. Oh, come, let us adore him. And even if you don't know who Jesus is, even if you don't fully understand what Christmas is about, all of us in here have probably hummed along, oh, come, let us adore him. And of course, we picked that title because it's Christmas and it's the theme of these psalms that we've been looking uh, through. If you're just brand new to church, first time you've ever been to Eastview, for the last 14 months, we've pretty much been in these psalms. Okay, We've been hanging out in these psalms for the last 14 months. But today, we're going to focus on not the adoring part, oh, come, let us adore him. We're going to focus on the come part. Look there in verse 2. Simple word, come into his presence. Yes, there's adoration. Yes, Christmas is about worship. Yes, it's all the things we've talked about the last several weeks. It's the trumpets, and it's the, it's the praises, and it's the shouts, and it's the joyful noise. But more than anything else today, the Christmas invitation from God in this song is come. In fact, worship, if it's really correctly understood, is an invitation to come into the presence of God. So let's look at this invitation today. First of all, it's an invitation to all. I just want to make this clear today. The, the Christmas message is God's invitation to everyone. Verse 1, it says, make a joyful noise. Remember that great word? It just means to shout out. Just a noise. You don't have to sing pretty. Just shout to God. He'll take it. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Who? All the earth. Now, literally, that word earth there means dirt. <laughs> it means ground. It means territory, perhaps. But we know that God doesn't want the dirt to sing out to him. He wants the people to live on that dirt. He wants all the earth. In other words, not just the people of God, Old Testament, not just the descendants of Abraham, the Hebrews, the Jewish people as we understand it. He wants all people to come and praise him, which means that there must be a reason for all people to make a joyful noise before the God of the Old Testament. You see, sometimes we get confused and we think, oh, Old Testament God, he just liked Jewish people. He didn't like anybody else. And probably most of us in here are not by race Jewish. Most of us are Gentiles. So what does the Old Testament God have to say to us? Well, you remember that his covenant with Abraham, his covenant people, the Jewish people, was a covenant for all people. I love, some people miss the, per, the first part of the Christmas story. It, it's in Matthew uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. And, and I know why you, why you miss this part, because it's a really boring way to start a book. If I was talking to Matthew, I'd say, Matthew, don't start a book, you know, start a book like that. It's a story about Jesus, and he starts with Abraham, and he goes through the genealogy. And if you're honest in here today, you've probably read Matthew 1, uh, verses 1 through 16, just going, blah, 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 honest. Or you made up some words sound like Dr. Seuss or something, and you're just reading names. They mean nothing. And you, you get down to verse 17 where it says, and this is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. But don't skip over those 16, because those 16 in the genealogy of Jesus Christ have people, guess what, who are not Jewish. There's a prostitute from Jericho that's in the lineage of Jesus. There's a lady that, that 1,100 years before Jesus was born in the same town of Bethlehem married a dude named Boaz. Her name was Ruth, and she was from Moab. Even the lineage of Jesus Christ is not totally Jewish. Why is that? Well, it's because God always intended to have his love go towards all creation. If you look at the covenant in Genesis 12, 3, between Abraham, he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a great nation. But he says this in Genesis 12, 3, through you, all families on earth will be blessed. All families, not just Jewish families, not just your family, all families on earth will be blessed. That's why when the shepherds hear the, the proclamation from the angel to the shepherds, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? All the people. This promise that God made, this desire for us to come, 
has always been about all people. And that's good news for you today because that includes you. You're an all people. You're the people that God wants to come into his presence. No matter who you are, what race you are, what social standing, how much money you do or don't have, mistakes you've made in the past, what, the way you think, the kind of music you like, the way you look, none of it matters to God. He wants all to come. That's why he sent his son Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. And not just every race and every uh, background and every human ever created is invited to come into his presence with singing. But look in verse 5, his faithfulness to all generations. It doesn't run out. You hear in the Old Testament a lot, they, they, they would say this, the God of my father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the God of our fathers, because the people of Israel sometimes were always stuck in the past. Oh, God was God back then, man. He was splitting the Red Sea, and he was doing miracles, and he was giving laws on the mountain, but now that's the God of our fathers. And what they missed often in the Old Testament was he's the God of every generation. He doesn't change, and he equally loves you. Simply put, there's no place on earth that you can live and no period of time in which you can live where the invitation of God to come does not exist. That means that every one of you here now has an invitation from God to come closer. And this invitation to come closer to God is not just to hang out and kind of be those people at the party that hang out over the corner and nobody talks to them. This is an invitation to know God. Look at this, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. This word mean, means a little bit more than knowing the facts. I'll get to that in just a moment. But the Lord is God. He is the only God. The word here is very important. I'm going to give you some word studies if you're visiting. I love words. I love you know, chewing them up and seeing what they mean. The word here is Elohim. You've probably heard it before. It's the word for God. What you may not know is that all the Canaanite gods and all the people that spoke the languages of this time, they called all their gods El. Do you ever see the word L in any Bible language or in any Bible word? It's God. And so the Canaanite gods were L. Moa, uh, Baal was A. Uh, was, uh, Baal was L. Baal was L. Try to say that as a new tongue, tongue twister, right? Ail, Baal. Okay, anyway, uh, now I'm just playing in my brain. I'll come back in just a moment. Here we are. Okay, L was the name of gods. The Jewish people, they want to distinguish their god, Yahweh, from all the other gods. And so Elohim is plural of the word El. To them, that was their way of expressing, he's God, but he's the God. He's the big God. He's the bigger than your God, God. He's the only true God. He's multiple times your God. He's Elohim. He's always plural. And uh, this week, it's kind of interesting in our culture, people still debating God's and you guys probably heard in the news this weekend up at Wheaton College, a very conservative evangelical college, that one of the professors made a statement about God of the Muslims and the God of Christianity being the same God. Everybody wants to be the same God. But the distinction from God, and I'll tell you why in just a moment, the God of the Muslims and the God of the Hebrews and, and, or the uh, Old Testament Jewish faith and the God of Christianity is a different God. I'll tell you in just a moment. But the deal is, is that we've always been comparing gods Here's what you need to know about God in general. He knows everything. He sees everything. He's bigger than everything. And, um, and he's stronger than everything. In other words, he's God. If you're going to call yourself God, you should have all those things. You should be able to see everything and know everything and be stronger than everything and be bigger than everything. If you're not those things, then you're not really a God. Right, so lesson number one today, before you come into his presence, get yourself a God <laughs> that works for life. And God is that God. And that's what's great about this culture, and this is what I love preaching this time of the year, because everybody in this culture is enamored with Jesus Christ, but we can't make that baby in the manger what we want him to be. He does not invite us into his presence to be what we want him to be. He invites us into his presence of who he truly is. And when we get there, we find, oh, he's exactly what I need. That's the call of Christmas. Come to me as I am. He goes on to describe himself in some other ways. I love this. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. That word made simply means to form with the hands as in creation. He formed us, which is another good news today. No matter who you are in here today, God made you. You're not an accident. He has a purpose. He formed you inside your mother's womb. There's something he's got going on for you. He values you, and that means also that because he made you, that 
He owns you. He made us. We are his. Now, you may declare that you're not his. You may run away from him. You may say, no, I'm not going to follow him. But no matter what you say about him, you're his. And that makes some of us uncomfortable in here because there have been a lot of people in some of our lives who are super powerful. They have power over us. And they've not been loving. They've not been caring. Some of us have experienced that with former spouses. Some of us have experienced that with our parents growing up. Some of us have experienced that with bosses at work or even church leaders. They have power of some sort over us, and they've made us feel bad. They've abused that power to build themselves up. But here's the good news about God today. He's not like your former parent or coach or any of those people that have abused their power. Here's what we know about God. Verse 5, the Lord is good. See, that's, that's the difference. There are power trippers in our life who use their power to get what they want out of us, but that's not God. God owns us, and he made us, and yet he's still, he's not obligated, but he still is good to us. That's the good news of the scripture. And some of you may be tired of hearing this old news, but I never get tired of expressing it, especially at Christmas, and especially if you're visiting here today. Let me tell you about this God who invites you in, who's a good God. He is a God who has steadfast love, verse 5, that endures forever. I've described it before. It's that great Hebrew word, chesed. It's, It's a description of God's commitment to us. He has said, I do, and he will never say, I want a divorce. He has said, let's date, and I will never break up with you. He has said, I'm in, and I'm never going to be out. He said, I love you, and I'm never going to fall out of love with you. God's steadfast love, this passionate commitment to the people that he has made a covenant love with. God is not going to turn back on that love. That's an incredible thing. And his faithfulness lasts forever. I love this. In a world that feels like every other day something's going to mess up or blow up or there's going to be some kind of protest or there's going to be some kind of uh, you know social issue that comes up God's firm look at this his faithfulness to all generations the word faithful literally means to be firm no matter what happens to your day today or tomorrow no matter what's going on in your life right now God's God he ain't changing he ain't moving you can stand on him he's a firm foundation he's the rock of our salvation right he's not going anywhere so we have this incredible, I'm just, I'm just giving you this incredible um, idea today that Christmas is about a God that comes and says, hey, I'm in charge, and I made you, and I love you, and I'm not going anywhere. Amen, yes. And not only that, but we got this watchfulness that's alluded to here in verse 3, that we are his people, the sheep of his pasture, I don't have time to go into this because this is not this sermon, but you know how helpless and not very smart sheep are? All through the scripture, guess what we're called? Sheep. We just can't get it on our own. We need a shepherd to guide us. We need a shepherd to help us. God comes along. We are the sheep of this God who invites us in. And I pray that if you're here today and you're visiting, that you hear loudly this invitation to know him. Let's go back to that word just for a moment. The word know in the Hebrew language is more than just know because many of us in here know the Christmas story. We know the shepherds. We know about the wise men. We know about the swaddling clothes. We know about the, the angels out singing glory to God in the house. We know the Christmas story. Maybe Santa Claus mixes in there somewhere. We get some things mixed up. But we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Most people can answer that, but this invitation to God is not just to know about him, it's to know who he is. That's what this word means. This word literally could be translated to confess, to be convinced of something that's true down deep in your heart, to know God. When we come to worship, we come into his presence. Here's the invitation. Come into his presence. Know that he is God and that he is all these things we just talked about. And so... Some in here, we know the facts, but we don't know God, and the invitation today is to come and know him. Amen, brother. And we have an invitation not only to know him, but an invitation to come closer. God wants us to come closer. That's the invitation of Christmas. 
Jesus' birth is God's eternal invitation for all who live on earth to know him and to come closer. Look at the title of the song. Right before verse 1, most of you have like in all, all capital letters, a psalm for giving thanks. Remember, these words were a part of the ancient documents. And uh, by these titles, sometimes we can figure out what this song was about. This song was used, most scholars believe, in procession. In other words, we've said this before, every year, three times a year, every good Jewish person was supposed to go to Jerusalem, and they were supposed to sing songs along the way as they get ready for worship to go into the presence of God. It's an invitation to come. And we look at this word come, by the way, in verse 2, and you look at the word enter in verse 4, they're the same Hebrew word. It's translated different to give different meaning to this context, but it's the same word in the Hebrew. Come, enter. And that was the annual invitation three times for the people of God to make a procession of worship to come into the presence of God, to enter into his presence. Verse 4, we get some insight into what this looked like. Imagine if you guys will. You live way north, like in Nazareth or something. You have to travel three or four days in a caravan, not a Dodge caravan, a caravan caravan, right? It's a real caravan. And uh, are you coming from the south, from Judah? Are you coming from, from, the, uh, from the east and the west? And you're coming together to Jerusalem. And remember, you're always going up because Jerusalem is built on these four hills. And you're going up to the house of God. And there would come a time where you'd come through a mountain pass. You'd go, ah, we're closer to God than we've ever been before. And you would sing, and you'd be in procession. And other pilgrims who were going on the same trip, you're all going the same place. You'd sing the same songs. And then you would get close to the temple proper. You'd come up the mountain, and you'd come this complex. And and, and then it would be enter his gates with thanksgiving. Because there were these big gates that you entered into the place of the, the, the temple where God's house was. And so, yeah, enter his gates. As we enter the gates, we're singing, we're thanking God, we're praising him. And then... We enter into his courts. We're closer still. We're the gates, and then we're into the courts, depending on who you were, a man or a woman or a non-Jewish person. You had different courts that you had to go to. But you are now in the open-air courts. You could see the building where God lived. You're right at the doorstep of God's house, and you're moving ever closer. We're in the gates. We're singing. We're in the courts. We hear the Levites and the band singing praises to God. We are in the presence of God. And each of these gates and these court entrances brought each worshiper ever closer to God, literally coming to the place where his ark dwelt and where his presence was. But here's the deal. This song, if you you really understand it, invites us even closer. Honestly, today, if I could say, hey, guys, I've just got some cool spiritual news for you. Jesus just moved into town, and his house is right down the street, and we could just all march down there right now. We'll sing songs as we go and we can come up to his house. Would that be thrilling? <laughs> you guys would all go. Some of you think I'm crazy and never come back, but some of you would go, right? But, but God says, I don't want you just to come to my house. Why don't you come in? Look at this word again. Come into his presence. The word presence in the Hebrew language this translated presence here is literally the front of the head the face this is literally this is really literally come into my face in other words I want to have a personal relationship with you see during this time of year I was struck with this this week during this time of year we're reminded of an invitation song that we sing to God it comes from Isaiah the other famous Christmas passage that predicted that Jesus was going to be born he said he's going to be born of, of a virgin, and you'll call him what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so probably starting from that time, even up to this time, we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We give God an invitation. Please come and ransom messed up Israel. And we, come, we say to God, this is, this is typically human. God, we're a mess. Our lives are crazy. Our families are messed up. Our, our futures are in question. Our past is haunting us. Whatever it is in your life today, God, help us. Please come, come, God, with us. That's not crazy. You know what's crazy? What's crazy is that God would ask us to come to him. And they would get so close that he would be born in the person of Jesus Christ to get close enough so that we could have relationship, face-to-face, intimate relationship with him. 
the difference between the God of Christianity and the God of Jewish faith and the God of the Muslim faith is really simple. And you can ask if you've got a Muslim friend, and if you're here today and you're a Muslim, or you're here today and you're Jewish, or you're some other faith, let me just tell you what's different from our God than your God. This is a simple question you ask any person in the world. Did your God come in the flesh to get near to me? And I, I bet you a uh, million dollars, they'll all go, no. Allah doesn't come. Jehovah, if you're an Old Testament Jewish person, Messiah hasn't come. But for us, Jesus Christ in a manger is God come in the flesh. He has come. Our God has come close to us so he can invite us to come close to him. Amen. And so here's the deal. Peace on earth, good news of great joy, is more about peace on earth. It's not just about peace among nations. It's not about people getting along and not fighting anymore. It's about peace between us and God. God coming and saying, I'm with you. Now you can be with me. And Jesus lived out this invitation all through his life. I hope you pay attention to these verses. I've got them written down in your e-news notes, whether you're electronic or your hard copy here today. But I just did this search of the New Testament of Jesus saying, come. You know what? He said it a lot. Jesus told us to come a lot. And the very first followers, his first disciples, his apostles, when they were, he was walking down the Sea of Galilee shore, and they came up to him and said, hey, Jesus, 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 where are you staying? He simply said, come and see. Come. It's an invitation. Hang out with me. See the life I'm living. See what I'm all about. When kids were being loud and rowdy in church in the first century, when Jesus was probably teaching the Beatitudes, they might have lost a Beatitude because some kid was being rowdy like I was at church. He's teaching. People are all around. Kids are going crazy. The disciples are saying, hey, you kids, shut up. Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Let the little children what? Come to me. He's always saying Come. There's a man with a deformity showed up at church in Mark chapter 3. He stood at a distance because he was not welcome into the worship service because his deformed hand meant that God was against him. But God in the flesh, Jesus, says to him in the middle of church service, come here. And I would say to you that invitation was greater even than the healing he brought to his hand. Jesus calling him in. Jesus said to a rich man in Mark 10 who was so poor all he had was money, come and follow me. Come. Come. Get rid of your stuff that's in the way of you and God and come and follow me. When the apostle Peter wanted to experience the miracle of walking on water, he looks at the Jesus, which you would never, should never say to a ghost, but he does. They thought he was a ghost. And they said, if you're Jesus, tell me to come. What did Jesus say? Come. When he brought salvation to the life of Zacchaeus, he looked up into a tree. He looked at Zacchaeus, this tax collector who had ripped off everybody in Jericho, and he said, come down. I'm going to your house. He invited himself over for dinner. And then later he said, salvation has come to this house. When Jesus wanted to paint a picture of his kingdom, in Luke chapter 14, he told a story about a king who prepared a feast. And when everything was ready, he said to his servants, now I want you to go to the people invited and say, come, for everything is now ready. And of course, there's a word that many of us in this room have taken comfort in throughout the years. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. You probably resonate with it today. Jesus says this, come to me. Come to me, all of you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's the message of our God. Come, come, come closer. That's the invitation today that the same one the shepherds received 2,000 years ago. I want to tell you about these Christmas shepherds. They knew God. They knew who he was. They might have been singing this song when the angels showed up. They, they knew this song. They were descendants of Abraham. They were promised ones. They knew God. But you know what? These shepherds, by the way, they lived in David's hometown, King David, the most famous King David. They were living in Bethlehem. They had special connections maybe even to God. But when the angels appeared to them on that hill 2,000 years ago, the shepherds were outsiders. They literally lived outside of Bethlehem, but they were socially outsiders because they were poor. Nobody gave them any mind. They were spiritual outsiders. 
because they were looked down on as dirty and filthy and not favored by God. But they were invited closer. The message of the angels was, come closer. That's how they interpreted it. All that glory to God and the highest stuff, they interpreted that as an invitation from God. That's why they say in Luke chapter 2, 15, let us go and see this thing which the Lord has made known to us. And I don't know how outside you are today, but I know this, that however outside you are, God's asking you through his son Jesus to come closer. And we're gonna give you a chance in a few moments to come closer. You can make excuses. You can say, no, it's too cold. It's too close to Christmas. I got plans. I don't have a shirt to put on. We got that. I don't have a towel. We got that. I don't have a plastic bag to put over my car. We got that. You could make excuses. The shepherds could have said to them, well, that's pretty cool. Some dude was born in Bethlehem today. But it's different when you go and you see him. Because this, this scripture says, come into his presence. Literally come into his face and I tell you today that when those shepherds moved out from the distance and they came to Bethlehem and they found a mother with a baby with swaddling clothes and they looked into baby Jesus' face, they came into the presence of God face to face and it changed their lives forever. And our prayer all week is that, you know, maybe maybe if we offer an invitation some outsider will come into the presence of God. So as usual, we don't know what's going to happen now. But we do have some pastors who are going to come and take their place down front. I'm going to ask you guys if you would do that now. And we're just simply here to receive you if you come down to make a decision. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ today. We want to witness that together. If you don't want to do it in here, you can walk out the back door and you can go to our water feature out in the atrium. We're going to do baptisms out there. And um, we just simply ask you to come closer. That's the invitation to Christmas. Come into his presence with thanksgiving because he loved you enough to come into your presence at the day he's calling you. And so let's all stand and then we're going to sing some songs. And as the Holy Spirit moves you to come closer, Today's a chance to give your life to Christ, to to show that outward decision through baptism. And we're going to celebrate this together today. So as you're moved, please come.